Can you see the slide? Yes, we can. OK, let me. Um, let me see if we can get the. All right. Does that look good to you? Great. OK, great. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you, and I hope that your opening ceremony went well and that you're excited to begin this journey of professional development and thinking about teaching research service in higher education today in Pakistan and in the United States. So we thought we would start, and I apologize for my, my colleagues' um, uh, not being able to be with us, but we developed this presentation together and I will do my best all by myself. So we thought we would start with this idea of reimagining the lecture because um, many um, of the things that we will do together in this journey on this grant project is thinking about active learning, collaborative learning, project-based learning, alternative strategies for pedagogy. But the fact is that many people, and in many countries, lecture. That's the tradition. That's what we're used to. And, and there are some really good things about lecturing. So rather than in, in English, we use the expression throwing the baby out with the bathwater, meaning don't throw out something good. Um, when it can be tweaked and improved. So um, if I go to the next slide, you'll see this um, humorous quote from Albert Camus. Some people talk in their sleep, lecturers talk while other people sleep. And then we raise the question, what's the problem with lecturing? So um, the cartoon on the left, and should there be a sudden loss of consciousness during this meeting, oxygen masks will drop from the ceiling, something that we're used to from flying. Um, and then the other slide, the other cartoon, which illustrates what I'm doing right now. Okay, now I'm going to read out loud every single slide to you, word for word, until you all wish you just die. So let's um, let's start by raising the discussion, and I'd like to hear from some of you. Um, uh, what what's the problem with lectures? What makes a lecture not effective? And if somebody there could call on people, it's a little hard for me to see. Can you hear me? I can now, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Actually, the problem with lecturing is that uh, it is sort of one way of communication because we are trying to give too much to the students, but we are not sure whether they are getting it or not. And uh, most of the time, they go to sleep. Okay, great, great comment. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for breaking the ice and making this lecture interactive. So it's it's unidirectional, it's one directional. It's like, we're talking, we're the experts, we're purveying the knowledge. Are the students getting it? Do we know if they're getting it? Um, a lecture, unless it's tweaked in the ways we're gonna talk about in the next hour, unless it's adjusted to test for student learning and the grasping of material, we don't know if they're getting it or not. We feel like we've covered it. We've done our job as, as professors. We've we've explained the material, but have our students learned it? That's the main problem with lectures. So thank you for that excellent answer. Other comments? Yes, thank you. Basically, sometimes uh, uh, people uh, are sitting in a lecture uh, in which they don't have any type of interest in that particular subject. So maybe in that particular situation, they are uh, sleeping in that particular lecture. It may be one of the reasons. Yeah. Okay. Great point. So how do we how do we motivate our students to to stick with us in a lecture if they're not interested in the subject, right? And this is they're there out of some kind of obligation or because we take attendance or 
um, or because, you know, they paid tuition, but not from an intrinsic sense of I'm dying to know what what this professor has to teach me. So another great uh, answer. Thank you so much. So if we go on then to the next slide, we raise this question, why lecture? And I want to I want to pause there for a moment and share with you some research about why we should lecture, uh, because like all kinds of pedagogy, the lecture, it can be done well or it can be done not so well. Research shows that it's particularly beneficial to lecture when you have novice learners, when people are first entering into a topic or a subject. And we're going to explore throughout the hour why that's the case. Um, for novice learners, we can help with using the lecture, we can help to build foundational knowledge that then they can use and incorporate when we do more hands-on activities or more project-based learning. So the lecture is in some ways um, an efficient way of, of uh, presenting material and stimulating learning because we, we've done all these studies where students are doing, if they're initially subjected to project-based learning or hands-on, but they don't have any background knowledge, they can sometimes learn things that you later have to correct. So some scholars argue that the best method is actually to begin with some lecturing and then move to more hands-on more, uh, more gradually throughout the course of the semester. Group work, which we are going to talk about throughout our time with you over the course of this journey together over many sessions. Group work, it takes longer, um, but it can be done very well as well. But you often have to circle back if the students don't have prior knowledge, if they don't have your foundational knowledge, you have to circle back and do some correcting. So if we're going to lecture, Let's talk about how we can do it well. These are the goals for the session when Nancy and Trey and I were designing them. Um, and they include um, talking about what makes lectures effective. We're going to do that. That's one of our goals. We're going to um, discuss with you teaching strategies that we have found to be useful for engagement. And we're going to evaluate. We're going to come back to this question why lecture at the end um, and look at the benefits and the constraints of it. So um, let's start with design. Planning ahead, as as we all know, is so important in in putting together a good lecture, right? We we know that we know the material that we've been hired to teach, but we have to think about who the students are in the room and how we can take them on a journey with our material. I mentioned a few minutes ago that lecturing can be a very efficient means of teaching and in part because it reduces the cognitive load on our students. You, the expert, one of the most important things you do is you explain to them what's important and what's significant. For a student who comes into your class who has no prior knowledge, who is a novice learner in the discipline, if they are engaged, their tendency is to write down everything you say, right? Because they don't know yet what's important, what's significant, what the main points are. So when we're planning ahead for our lectures, we really need to think about um, almost like points on a map. Where do I want to get the students to what are the important significant takeaways that I want the students to grasp from this lecture? And we have to do the job of holding up those signposts and saying, this is a really important point. I mean, sometimes I will even say to students, you need to be taking notes, write this down. This point is very important. And we find that not just in lecturing, but in, in reading and our students learning how to read in our disciplines. They will read all the words, but they won't necessarily know what was I supposed to get grasp from that paragraph? So I often do reading practice with my students and um, and make a little MP3 of a paragraph or a page and help them with the reading just to say how I as an expert reader think about this passage or what I would write down or what I would take away. It's important in lecturing. One of the one of the values of it 
is for our students to watch our model as thinkers and professors, to watch us do our own analysis in our fields. We're modeling for them the way an economist or a historian or a literature professor or a biologist, how we think about our disciplines. We're modeling that and we are identifying connections for them. So when this point, teaching the students in the room, we really have to think about what they know coming in, because this is in part how memory works. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But do our students, would it be valuable to do a pretest? You know, should we find out where our students are, how prepared they are? In the United States, we've been um, especially with COVID. Um, I'm sure it's no different in Pakistan, but we've been having problems with students coming to college less prepared than we as their faculty expect them to be. So are they novice learners? If you're teaching at an introductory level, it really depends what they learned in high school and how well they got it, right? If you're teaching graduate students or you're teaching upper level undergraduates, you can make more assumptions about your students and how prepared they are. And, and lots of research shows that experts lear learners learn best from the lecture, not our novice learners. So as I said, we wanna keep, the over keep in mind the overall journey, right? So just like the little push pins, um, where, what's the root of the lecture? Where are we taking students over the course of this um, class period together? So the shift in the paradigm, the shift in the mindset, as the quote has there, from the student perspective, not what will the instructor cover, not about us, but rather what will the students be guided to do? The importance of a compelling introduction to get students attention and curiosity. So um, this is, I think, also very important. We've talked a little bit about students' background knowledge as a factor um, and that expert learners learn the most from hands-on learning, but that novice, um, that I, I, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Expert learners are most able to learn from hands-on and group projects. We often think oh, we need to get the students doing hands-on right away to raise their motivation and for them to understand the significance. But if they don't have enough background knowledge, that doesn't always work. As students gain more background knowledge, we can introduce more active learning. So how do we grab their attention? As one of you was just saying, if students aren't motivated, if they're not interested, then they tend to sleep, they check out, they multitask, they look at their phones, whatever it is that they do. Well, a good story, a good compelling introduction to get the students attention and curiosity, something that the students can relate to, um, something that might inspire an emotional connection to the content, something where you as the teacher are evidencing your own passion and enthusiasm for what got you interested in this topic. Emotions play an important role in learning and cognitive engagement can happen with a story, right? We, you know, we get interested when we see each other, when we make friends with our peers, we often do that through storytelling, right? Families often pass down their traditions through storytelling. Tell the one about the time. For me, one of the terrible things I remember is a time when my mother baked a coconut cake for my uncle's birthday and we were at a picnic in the park and I was like, you know, in sixth grade and she asked me to go get the cake out of the car and I did, but I tripped and I fell and the coconut cake ended up in the dirt and my mother, you know, so this is like a story that we tell in my family, right? But, but when we tell stories, we care about the protagonist. Maybe you don't care about my mother and my cake, I, I don't know. But, but it's a way to bring people in, to get them interested. And you can organize an entire lecture. We'll be talking about different ways of organizing lectures in a few minutes, but you can organize an entire lecture around a story, right? And the cast of characters. And then we know as learners, well, a story has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end. That keeps the attention and the cognitive engagement of our students. And then we can spin off mini stories, right? That are also part of that larger story. 
So, um, so that's a way to get students engaged from the beginning. Think of a story that you can tell um, that connects to your content. My cake story didn't really connect to the content. I apologize, but it just came to me because I thought of it, you know, just the other day. Um, you can bring opposites together, right? You can pose a question that gets students thinking like, you know, is this true or is it false? Sometimes that kind of binary, and if they're not sure, and you can ask them some preliminary questions, that kind of a setting up of a binary can really bring a higher level of student engagement in a lecture. But as um, you can see that uh, the popularity in the United States of the TED Talks, right? These are short stories, but that get at larger issues. So let me see. Um, after a compelling introduction, we want to follow with a brief overview of where we're going and then restate the learning goals for the lecture. So that's just a good basic overall strategy. We want to define terms and concepts. And I, I repeat this, especially for our novice learners. If you've got a group of students who are new to a subject matter, then um, this is something that we'll, they'll check out if we haven't defined the terms. If they're going to hear terms and they don't know the meaning of those terms, then they're going to check out. So defining terms and concepts, even though it seems like a kind of preliminary thing, or it's not that exciting, or how are we going to do that in an engaging way? Um, it's very hard. It's very important because it's very hard for students to build their own foundation of knowledge, their own schema of your subject area if they don't understand the terms that you're going to use. So I mentioned the storytelling as a good, um, a good way of organizing a lecture. But there are certainly other ways of doing that as well. Um, but stories have certainly held the test of time, just as the lecture, something we've been using for 900 years in higher education, has held the test of time. Um, we could also do case studies. Um, I know these are very popular in universities in Pakistan. Um, the case study method, again, it gets, it gets people into the details that might be engaging, that pose a problem. But a good case study is always connected to the larger themes and issues. Um, multiple viewpoints, um, helping our students see a subject or a topic from the point of view of, of several different actors within that area, that can be very engaging. Whether those actors are theorists who have different theories of the economy or of historical change, or whether they're people who were impacted differently by the same single event, right? This is, as a history professor, I often do this method um, for, our, for our history students because they think history is boring. And I, of course, love history. Um, so I try to take an event like, you know, like, um, you know, a flood or a revolution and say, you know, how did people at the top of the path or hierarchy experience this, right? How did people who were without means and resources experience this? How did men and women experience this, this event differently? How did people of different ethnicities experience this same event differently? So that can engage students. Um, I mentioned setting up a binary like a pro-con can engage students cognitively. Um, Discussion-based lectures are often a good way um, to achieve a high level of student engagement. Um, we give students questions to answer at the beginning, and then we take their answers and we lecture more informally on the sly, on the fly, depending on what they have to say. There always needs to be time to summarize, and that helps students moving from kind of a short-term memory or a new introduction, a new exposure, to start to build their own knowledge. Because when we summarize in our lecture, then we're kind of giving another clue to our students about what they should have taken away, right? So, so making points where you're stopping in a lecture and summarizing is really, really important for the learning process. And also giving our students opportunities to answer questions and for you to ask for the students to ask questions and for you to answer questions and he, here you'll see the slide indicates provide several channels for communication 
in the in the traditional classroom that many of us grew up in you ask questions this way raising your hand but we've come to realize um, in a more nuanced way that that method is really good for extroverts right people who want to hear themselves speak other people and in some cultures it's asking questions could seem challenging or rude so depending on your cultural context, how are you going to give students the opportunity to ask questions? You know, you can, you can use a back channel. You can, um, you know, you can have students post questions to a discussion board. You can have students write questions on slips of paper and pass them to the aisles, right? You can have students leave questions for you at the end of the class in a in a box in the back of the room and then you take those and you you build those answers into your next lecture there are lots of different ways of doing it but just saying to the class does anybody have any questions that doesn't always work right because students will be embarrassed to um, sometimes to ask questions in front of their colleagues or it might show that like everyone else has grasped this material what's wrong with me um it's been interesting because as we taught remotely during COVID, um, I thought students would ask a lot of questions in Zoom or, you know, on the chat using the chat feature. But really, the students told me, no, they didn't feel all that comfortable doing that. So let me pause for a moment. How do, how do you what opportunities do you give your students to ask questions? What works in your classrooms? In I am sciences and in the other universities in Pakistan where you teach. If you have the chance to raise their hands and specifically for your questions. Uh, we normally we normally uh, get their questions by raising their hands or otherwise they can directly also ask the question about during the lecture. So students students feel comfortable raising a hand during a lecture and saying, it's hold on. It's, it's not an issue in, in, in our culture if they ask question of degrees and they directly uh, question the teacher. So in most of the situations, it is not considered, considered as any uh, cultural issue. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we're talking about design. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, I have uh, another comment regarding the same question. Actually, sometimes we allow the students to ask questions during the lecture because it depends upon the topic. Uh, we cannot decide that you have to raise your question at the end of the lecture because it depends upon the topic. Sometimes the content is a kind of like, for example, it is related to finance. So when you are um, solving questions and you're doing uh, maths and all these things. So you have to allow them to raise questions during the lecture. I think it's I think it's best if we can do it that way, really, because the question may seem irrelevant by the end, or if you're taking them through um, a, a, an equation or a, you know a, a problem that they're solving, if they don't understand and we haven't answered that question, then we tend to lose them. Right, so I think that's that's best if you can do it that way. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, I would like to add that uh, I have I personally have given my students two options: whether you have to ask the question in the class, uh, or if you are not comfortable asking in the class, uh, in the class, I have created a WhatsApp group for my students where all my students are in that group. And if anyone is feeling comfortable asking a question in that WhatsApp group lately or later on, whenever he is comfortable, he can ask the question. So I'll be answering him, you know, whether in the WhatsApp group or when the next morning I have a class with him, I'll answer the question the same way. But I have to take the questions. That's important. Thing. Yeah, that's a great example of a multiple channels 
for answering students' questions, right? You've got the your your own presence and proximity in class, but you've got your WhatsApp group. And the students, often what you find when you develop something like that through a social media that the students are very comfortable communicating in is that they will answer each other's questions, right? Even before, even before you get you get to it, right? Um, and so it can be very useful that way. The students, um, it creates a community. Um, for the students and they help each other. So I love to hear that. Thank you. So we want to talk about opportunities for engagement um, in, in a traditional lecture. How can we make our lectures more engaging for our students? Um, this is Dr. Darshak Patel, and he is an award-winning teacher at the University of Kentucky. And I will, hopefully this will work. I will play this video. If not, I did share the, um, uh, I believe Trey sent uh, Dr. Shahid Ali this slide deck so everyone can have it and you can watch it, but let's see. Hi, I'm Darshit Patel. I teach large lectures in economics at the University of Kentucky. I'm excited to share my experiences on teaching large lecture classrooms. Uh, first, of, first foremost, large lectures get tricky. Uh, the key is to approach it with the idea that one can also make large lecture feel small. I don't feel I'm intimidating, but students tend to feel that I am because of the largeness of the class. I focus on creating a warm, welcoming environment. I want students to feel comfortable and understand that they shouldn't feel like a small fish in a big pond. First, I get to know the students by asking every student on the first day to fill out a one-page self-introduction handout. Then at the same time, I ask students to introduce themselves to each other and pick a random group of students to introduce each other with the hope of easing fear or anxiety and promoting a culture of friendliness. Right, right about then, I'll also read most of the handouts throughout the period of the semester, using them as a resource to engage with different set of students uh, across the period of the semester. Students enjoy the personal feel of the classroom and constantly maintain the excitement throughout the semester. Uh, this helps me to adapt with the diverse student body as well, and also helps me engage them at a personal level. And then throughout the semester, instructors can capture student attention through consistent engagement. Engage, engage, engage. Key advice, break classroom lecture every 10 minutes or so to make sure they're maintaining the attention span. Uh, there's several resources available to do so, but for a first time large lecture instructor, it is wise to adopt these resources strategically. Uh, adopting all resources at once can get really overwhelming. Uh, in economics, we're really lucky to be able to find relevance of economics in almost every part of our lives. I take advantage of that by playing music, mostly economic related, but doesn't need to be at the start of the class. It again creates and sets an, a mood, an exciting mood where students are already begin, students are already ready to begin learning at the end of the song. Uh, faculty can also engage with students using a response systems. There are several types available and that one can adapt depends on the needs of the instructor. What a response system does is it provides a way for the instructor to receive a real time feedback on students understanding of the topic. Uh, so real time assessment, in other words, instructors can introduce a concept or two and then do a quick concept check to gauge students understanding. This helps instructors to figure out whether to spend more time on a concept or not. Students can also work on groups or individually at the discretion of the instructor. A traditional tool instructors can also use in large lectures is a think pair share tool where students are provided a discussion question and asked to think about it, pair up with someone to discuss and then share with the class. Instructors can walk around and engage with a different group of students, again getting to know them and personalizing the classroom. Again, IJ is making it feel small. Uh, popular media, social media are also very important resources. Uh, breaking classroom lectures using videos also help maintaining students' attention. Videos or podcasts can be used within or outside the classroom, again, consistently engaging them in and out of classroom. And then social media, on the other hand, can also help in engaging students beyond the four walls uh, of the classroom. I personally typically use Twitter to share classroom announcements, articles, videos, homework deadlines, and so on. Again, the goal is to continue learning inside the classroom as well as outside the classroom. 
Uh, let me give you some uh, tools or some examples of classroom management that could reduce your cost of teaching at a large lecture. First, if possible, try and create a course packet where instructor can provide some notes for students by leaving a good chunk or good part of the packet blank for students to fill in during class. So that way they can listen to you and at the same time uh, fill in the blanks whenever needed. Second, having a detailed syllabus with a detailed frequently asked questionnaire to will really help to reduce the number of emails received. A large lecture can get overwhelming, especially if you're getting consistent emails about the simplest things uh, within the class. Lastly, uh, using TAs effectively. If you do have a choice of having multiple TAs, what has worked for me is to define a head teaching assistant and distribute the work to individual TAs accordingly. One of the goals and the task of the head TA would be to include, uh, would be include to maintain the quality and the timeliness of all tasks assigned to all the individual TAs. At the same time, to incentivize the TAs, they also are told that if they do well by providing uh, by providing the task in a timely manner, they will have an opportunity of becoming the head TA during the following year. Lastly, enjoy your time in there. Uh, use your personal stories, even images that can engage with students. If it's needed to connect with the students, do what's needed. Hopefully these ideas and resources that I shared with you help you within your large lecture and create a very inviting environment for your students. All right, I'm trying. Hi, to I'm Darshit Patel. No, no, I no. teach large lectures in economics no. at the University of Kentucky. All right. Um, so Darshak, um, such a great teacher, and he laid out a number of really good ideas there, um, including what um, what what our colleague there at IM Sciences was just talking about using the WhatsApp, creating an opportunity for students to continue learning outside of the class as well as learning inside the class. Also, I like this idea of um, I like this idea of giving the students some kind of scaffolded notes, right? Some kind of um, something where you're providing the structure, and this can be another way to emphasize what the key points and the main ideas are, but lots of blank areas for students to fill in what it is, their own understanding of what they're learning. Everything that we've been hearing indicates how important it is to create meaningful pauses, active pauses, um, because this is how we get at the problem that you all set out in our first discussion question, which is how do we know, how do we make the lecture more interactive and know if our students are actually learning what we're teaching? So this, um, this illustration developed by one of the instructional designers at the University of Kentucky is really useful. Um, and I wanna go over that, but, but I wanna start by saying that pauses help us to help our students move from short-term memory or working memory to building long-term memory about something that we're teaching them, right? And we all know this, right? We have all probably, as when we were students, we probably sometimes crammed, the expression crammed for a test, you know, where you're just like reviewing material um, at a rapid pace um, in hopes of being able to remember it and recall it when you need to. So how do we do something different from that? How do we make sure that our students are taking what we're teaching and really incorporating it into their own schema? We know that there's a limit to how much time, how much uh, content people can take in and how much time people can listen. So Darshak was giving an example of that. You wanna take a break and the conventional wisdom is at least every 15 to 20 minutes. In the United States, when TV was, um, you know, before all the streaming services, when everyone watched TV and there were commercials, there was some evidence that people would pay attention as long as until the first commercial break, right? So we we might think about, uh, you know, a tradition that we grew up in where there were very long lectures, but but students have a shorter attention span for all kinds of different reasons. So. Research suggests that people can remember about seven different chunks of information, um, but they will quickly lose new short-term working memory, knowledge from that. They will quickly lose it if they don't apply it. 
So we want to connect to their prior knowledge. Um, we want to do be intentional about do that, about doing that. We want to help them build a kind of neural pathway. And sometimes that's, you know, you're raising, asking questions, asking them for examples of something so that they can build their own understanding. Educational researchers tell us that experts remember better than novices. And why would that be? Well, it's because we can connect to our own prior knowledge. Um, so what can we do as professors to help build connections to prior knowledge? What can we do as professors to help build, take short-term working memory and turn it into long-term memory? So this is where the this um, uh, chart is useful. So Jennifer has laid out here the kind of traditional lecture with an introduction, topic one, topic two, topic three, question and answers at the end. And she shows you that, you know, basically in the traditional model of lecturing, we are asking our students to be pretty passive and then to like, you know, jolt of waking up questions at the end, right before, you know, they get to leave that one little active session. But in, as we rethink the lecture, Notice how Jennifer has built in this idea of active learning throughout the same time period. So we have an introduction and topic one, and then a little time to reflect, right? And, and to ask students a question, maybe do what um, Darshak was talking about, the think, pair, share, right? To stop and, and have people think about something or write something down, an opportunity to share it out. And then for you as the faculty member to take those ideas that the students are sharing and connect them back to that first topic. Um, and then we introduce topic two and we might have breakout groups after that where we ask the students in a small group to discuss something. And then topic three, um, et cetera, um, with um, some reflection. I can't really see the end of the slide. What does it say? Final thoughts and Q&A. Right. So we still have that opportunity for students to ask questions at the end, but it isn't the only time in which we have required them to be active. And this is really important because if you if if you go in at the beginning of a term and you do this traditional model where they're just sitting there and there's no expectation for them to participate and you do that two or three times, it becomes very difficult then to ever do this. Um, second method, right? Because you have basically conveyed to them, I'm expecting you to listen and to sit quietly. All right, so think, pair, share. Um, I'm sure many of you are are using a um, a version of this. Uh, Dr. Darshal, Darshak Patel, who's making his two names into one, Darshak Patel um, uses this quite a bit. Um, it's important in terms of good interaction and engagement, and it's also an opportunity to do what I've been talking about, to stimulate a connection to the student's prior knowledge. Polling surveys and audience response systems. Um, this is, you know, I, I don't know what systems you have available to you. There are ones that are part of learning management systems like Blackboard or Canvas. There's one that we use a lot um, in the United States, um, Poll Everywhere, there's Mentimeter. Some of these are free. Sometimes there's a, um, a like a site-wide license for a campus. But the idea is that you, you ask students questions, and these can be questions about prior knowledge, but they can also be questions where you are trying to see, did they learn this concept? Or am I just talking? Um, am I just talking? So um, I, these are um, ones that we designed through Mentimeter, and I won't ask you to do this, but you can ask um, questions to get a sense like how much group work, how positive was the experience for group work among our students. Um, you can give students a, a set of issues and ask them to rank them. Um, for you know things that they are most comfortable with or they're most important to least important. This was a question about um, how to build successful groups. 
you can do something with some of these response systems where you ask people to put in a reflection and then those can come up either as a word cloud or as different pieces of text that you can then respond to. So just some examples um, of different things. Um, but the um, one of the pioneers of this method of using audience response system is Dr. Mm -hmm. Eric who developed this method at MIT and Harvard. And he actually has, he does not move on to his next concept until the students have scored at least 80% correct on a question. So let's watch this little video um, where he illustrates, these are his actual students and he illustrates this technique. An electric field, as well as a magnetic field. Initially, they're not moving but I'm gonna turn on the electric field here. I'm actually gonna put some uh, tree pollen, which you can hopefully see. Whoa, that's a bit much, but you get the picture. You see that they're rotating in a clockwise sense. So the question is now, what is happening here? Is it the positive ions that are causing this motion and carrying along the pollen? Or is it the negative ions, right? If I turn off the electric field, then there is no electric field, nothing is moving. This will come slowly to rest. As I turn on the electric field, the ions here will be accelerated in the electric field. As they start moving in the electric field, they feel the effect of the magnetic force and that is what makes them rotate. So you have to see whether it's the positive or the negative ions or both that carry the pollen along in a clockwise direction. So take a minute to think about it and then enter your votes using the PRS system. No talking yet. Come up with your own answer. I still need uh, 10 to 20. I still need about 10 to 20 votes here. So please enter your answers. We have a disagreement clearly here. About a 50-50 split between two answers. I'll let you guess which ones. So turn to your neighbor and see if you can. And, and remember, finding one correct answer, for instance, the negative ions doesn't mean that the positive is, neg is necessarily true. So you have to really try out both. Go ahead, check with your neighbor and see if you can agree. <laughs>
a positive part of moving this an electric field as well as a magnetic field. All right, well, in the interest of time, I will um, I will close down Dr. Mazur's video, but you see in some ways it's a variation of the think pair share because he has them think and then share by posting their answers to the screen and then pair up and see if they can convince each other of what the correct answer is. Um, but what I like about that method, and this has been very popular in the STEM fields, is he knows whether or not his students understand the concept. And when you're teaching in a field where the concepts are layered and we need to understand one concept to move on to the next one, this can be a very effective method. Um, a more old school method is the minute paper. And this is something that can be done and interjected at any point in your lecture where you wanna do the same kind of thing, where you wanna get a sense of what the students are thinking, what they understand or don't understand. Here are some examples of the ways you can use the one minute paper. You can ask students to pose a question, to do a summary, to um, write down what the most confusing concept was and leave that with you at the end to make a personal connection or to tell you what the most important idea is. So you can get a sense of whether or not they're starting to, to be able to identify the significance of the topic that you are teaching. And finally, we want to spend just a few minutes talking about delivery of the lecture. So let me open this up to you. What do you think makes a good de vocal delivery or a good, what's it, what's important about, about developing our own skills as speakers, professors, lecturers? Uh, professor, I think the, the louder answer or the way of communication is the more uh, uh, good for the vocal delivery. When your voice is reaching very clear to the all audience, it is uh, good for a vocal delivery. So, uh, as, per my, as per my perception, I think uh, to be on the same level of as the students are, if they are starting grade, from the starting grade, you have to be on the lower level. And if they are on their final semesters, you have to be on their level. That's great. Those are both. So using the voice, projecting the voice. Uh, is and I point? think we can use different pauses. Uh, while uh, sometimes we have to speak louder to emphasize on the an importance of a topic. And sometimes we have to lower the voice and certain pauses if required at different moments. We have to follow those. Great, these are great ideas. So using, recognizing that there are gonna be times when you're gonna be sotto voce and be a little quieter. Other times when you're gonna be louder, moving around the proximity, being on the level intellectually of the students at times, trying to understand their point of view. Um, I would say, I would add also connecting emotionally to the material. This is, uh, one of the most important things that you show something of your passion and enthusiasm and you remember why you were drawn to these questions or why you care about this field and conveying that through the voice, um, thinking about the pace, right? We've all been in lectures that go too quickly. And sometimes as professors, when we see like I am right now, seeing like, oh, eight minutes, only eight minutes, right? My tendency may be to pick up the pace and we lose people when we do that. Um, there's something that, uh, that psychologists call social contagion. And that's if, if, if we are around people who are happy, we tend to be happier. And so thinking about that, right? Um, uh, Darshak was talking about creating a friendly environment in his class. Right. I mean, that's not always been the tradition. So the tradition might be to, you know, to have a kind of intimidating atmosphere in the class. But if you can create a sense of community and um, social belonging, that 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 can be an important part of the of the delivery. Right. That you're conveying something of your your love 
of teaching, your love of this subject matter, that is going to help your students as well. Any other comments about vocal delivery from my Pakistani colleagues? I think uh, vocal delivery is very relevant to your gestures when you are physically delivering your lecture. Uh, sometimes when you are trying to focus on something, on something then you try to uh, focus through your hands, with your eyes, with your words. So I think vocal should be very clear. It should be, uh, the speed should be at least that much so the, uh, the, the person who is listening to you should be very uh, clearly listen to you, like the words should be clear and complete, but it is very relevant to your gestures. And this this cartoon illustrates that well, I think, right? Um, the And that's, you know, it, in earlier times before there was magnification for our voices, um, gestures were really important. Important because there was a, it was a way to signal to people in the back of an out of an auditorium um, something of the meaning that you were conveying, right? But so I love that. I love that you raised gestures. Um, one of the things that that we have all um, been exposed to is visuals that do not help with learning, right? So this example of uh, an executive summary. Um, and different fields have different theories about this. There's been a lot of research on slide design. A group of um, engineering scholars at Penn State University have come up with a, something they call assertion evidence design, and they have studied the way people take information from slides and how it's really good to have the assertion, to have some illustration of that as part of the design. Um, but slides with lots and lots of text they just cause us to feel kind of anxious. Like, am I supposed to write all this down? Is all of this important? So just like we've been talking earlier about the importance of making guideposts for our students about what's helping them through your expertise, helping them as novice learners understand this is what's, this is significant. This is the main point. Um, a slide like this doesn't do a very good job with that. So that's um, that's important as well. And this is the um, last slide that I have for today, um, and it is symbolized by um, the pendulum. Because as I said at the very beginning of our time together, most of what you do in this project is going to be about embracing the revolution that we are in in higher education, and that is the move away from traditional lecturing toward more collaborative approaches, right? But this is a, like uh, educational theory can often be like a pendulum swinging one way to one and then to the other point. Um, it has the pendulum swung too far. Are there benefits to lecturing? As I've tried to illustrate some of them over the past hour. Um, let's let's end with a little discussion on that topic. What are the um, what are your thoughts about the benefits or the constraints of lecturing? Um, I think the benefits of lecturing is uh, at the beginning of the class when you students come, uh, we have to give them lecture like orientation. They're totally entirely new or those students who are very much passive we first have to provide some knowledge to them because sometimes uh, students are less motivated to respond when they don't know about the topic. So uh, I think in that particular stage, we have to have lecture. But later on, as um, uh, we have learned now and we are learning in this process for additional techniques, that after we have given them uh, some knowledge, we need to then uh, interact with them. We, we, we put them in discussions and uh, uh, such as think, pair, share or project based learning. We have to use these techniques so that we can make sure whether they have got what we were supposed to give them or not. Yeah, that's a great answer. And I think I think that's absolutely right. If um, if if we know that our students don't have the preparation to do 
the work at a college level in our field, then just putting them immediately into project groups, maybe, um, you know, maybe putting them at a disadvantage, right? So we as the guides, right, we as the the professors who are in charge of their journey, we have to use our expertise to help them build that knowledge base that they will then need to go um, more deeply into our, our material and our subject areas. So thank you. I think that's a great synopsis of, um, of what the point of this this whole um, last hour has been. So that's excellent. Thank you. Any other comments about um, the benefits of lecturing or this idea of moving away from lecturing toward collaborative learning? I think um, one thing I would like to say that, uh, as you mentioned, uh, for us, it's very interesting to see that uh, you guys in the US are talking about the same problems that we are facing here, you know, lecturing, moving from traditional teaching towards this uh, co collaborative teaching. I think one of the things uh, that I experienced is when we try, because we have a tradition, lecturing is a tradition, new students, young students come. One of the teachers started something new, like this kind of, you know, engaging them in different ways. What we realized in the beginning, since the culture was not there, teachers were not taking it seriously. They thought it's fun. Yes, it's not fun. But maybe the subject is not that important, you know, because the other teachers are doing the serious work. They're very serious. They're very, you know, uh, Focusing on their content, but this one gentleman or lady is going is going a different ways. So they were engaged, but the learning element was missing. This is an experience from the past, but now since many people are doing that, and you know, thanks to the internet and some of these Coursera and all these you know books programs, I think that that awareness is part of my hopes. Thank you very much. Well, this is um, just our first session, but we will have um, many more to follow where we will explore all of these techniques that we've been tossing around in more detail and hear about. It's really helpful to us always to hear about your experiences because we're designing this um, over here and then you have all your um, facilitators and faculty who are working there. So this to us is the the primary benefit because there are problems that we share in common at our universities across many, many miles. And then there are some things that can be unique um, to a particular university or to a particular culture. Um, I know that in Pakistan, the obligation is to teach in English um, and that, you're, that you often spend some time translating for your students. Um, that is, uh, um, less true in the United States, uh, although, you know, um, we have increasingly a more multilingual society, but the obligation is always on the part of the student to somehow make that work. So, um, so that's what's fun about this project is learning about what, what you all are doing and trying how it's working and what we're doing and trying and how it's working or not working. So um, thank you very much for staying this evening for this class. And um, I really appreciate your comments and your engagement with me. And I hope you have a great evening and I look forward to our next session. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Gethi. Uh, have a great day. And uh, yes, we will be in touch. In thank future. you. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye, thank you.